Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, the role of development finance institutions in Africa and how um, we can get recipient country priorities into the uh, better into the mix. Um, the webinar is organized by the Stockholm Sustainable Finance Center together with uh, Overseas Development Institute, ODI. Uh, Stockholm Sustainable Finance Center is a collaboration initiative between Stockholm School of Economics and Stockholm Environment Institute. It's a lot of Stockholms there, but uh, we and it's running over a number of years with funding from the Swedish government. One of the mandates of the a center, SSFC, is to support the scaling of investment in climate and the SDGs in developing countries. Um, there are large gaps in financing that we all know about, and there's a clear need to better understand how we can mobilize more private capital. And development finance institutions have an important role to play uh, to bridge between ODA and commercial finance. And this role in mobilizing private capital should play an increasingly important role in the coming years, given the needs uh, that developing countries currently face. <clears throat> and the uh, SSFC report that we're going to discuss today supports this agenda, uh, provides research insights on potential strategic opportunities for DFIs to broaden their impact on SDGs achievement by aligning where appropriate with national government uh, priorities and development efforts. So with that, I'd like to uh, hand over to Aaron Maltese, who's the director of SSFC. Thank you, Mons. Uh, my name is Aaron Maltese and I'm a senior research fellow at Stockholm Environment Institute and the program director for uh, the Stockholm Sustainable Finance Center. And we're very happy uh, that you've been able to join us today for this uh, webinar where we will um, first start with a presentation of uh, the report, uh, understanding the role of development finance institutions in promoting uh, development and assessment of three African countries. And after the presentation, we will have a panel discussion for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open up for, for questions also from, from the audience. And in the panel, we're, we're really excited to have a great set of panelists here uh, representing some, some key institutions. So we have Eric uh, Berilev, Chief Economist at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. He's also a member of the SSFC's advisory uh, board. Uh, Bruno Venn, who is the chairman of the Association of European DFIs. Uh, Jofi Grant is the CEO of Ghana Investment Promotion Center. St uh, Stefan uh, Dreihaupt, who is a principal economist at the IFC, International Finance Corporation and Azetse uh, Wera, who is a senior economist and uh, fi the financial sector deepening FSD at, in Kenya. So uh, I'll hand over now to uh, my colleague uh, George and uh, Alberto to give us the presentation of the report. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you, Mons, and thank you for uh, attending everyone. So uh, in what follows, I'll give a very quick um, highlight of the of the report. And this report uh, was uh, motivated by the the need to fill some uh, gaps that are, we found in the in the literature and also in the discussion uh, around DFIs and their, their their impact on development. Next slide, please. So uh, these are the authors. Um, this uh, report was written uh, by myself and uh, a team of uh, other colleagues from uh, ODI in London. Next slide. So a bit of um, an introduction here. First of all, we acknowledge and everybody I believe also uh, acknowledge that the DFIs are very important uh, development players. And these are financial actors who um, take advantage of private sector opportunities to invest in advancing uh, different uh, development uh, outcomes uh, in different contexts. And in Africa, there are a number of DFIs uh, that we can think of over 200 uh, on the continent, including uh, domestic and then foreign DFIs. And 
the, their impact has been well known, uh, usually uh, contributing towards uh, economic growth in the recipient countries um, through um, uh, revenue generation for the, for the government and also uh, direct employment to either the firms or or the financial in intermediaries that they, they invest uh, through uh, using different uh, instruments. Uh, but what is often uh, lacking or missing in this discussion and also in the literature is an, an understanding of the role of development plans and how they may uh, or should be viewed by DFIs. So what we do here is to focus on understanding the role of DFIs uh, towards um, supporting a recipient countries' development agenda, uh, but in the stand that we want to see the extent to which they align with these national development efforts or priorities. And if they do align, uh, what are the opportunities that, that there are for, for DFIs to take advantage of and how this should be done? And so we assess this uh, in three countries, Kenya, Ghana and Ethiopia. Um, our question is basically, you know, uh, taking cognizance of DFI's own development that they, or impact that they have been uh, um, making in these countries, we want to understand to what extent uh, should they prioritize uh, uh, these recipient countries' uh, development uh, agenda. And we do this by reviewing uh, a number of documents uh, that we, we, we see as development plans or strategies. Uh, and then synthesize these uh, uh, plans. And why, why did we do this? Because we want to understand where the, the opportunities are, which sectors that uh, are articulated as strategic sectors or priority sectors, and hence provides additional opportunity for DFIs to invest in. And the second point is that we, we try to map uh, different kinds of financial flows, uh, like um, foreign aid, uh, commercial credit uh, provided by the domestic uh, banking sector, uh, also uh, foreign direct investment among other uh, flows and DFI's own investment flows to these countries. And the essence here is that we want to see where the funding uh, gaps are, whether they are significant and where perhaps DFI's are under investing and or um, are not investing at all. And are uh, still, you know, sectors that are commercially viable and uh, where DFIs could take advantage of and, and go in and invest uh, to enhance their impact. And then the third um, approach was to uh, take this to the DFIs, of course, a selected uh, group of DFIs, uh, six here, a sweat fund, North fund, fin fund, uh, the IFC, the CDC group uh, of the UK, and then the German DFI uh, DEG. And so we engaged them and told them this is what we are doing and what is your perspective on this and how you know should we uh, approach this in terms of the way forward and so this uh, research is basically very forward looking it is not an evaluation of any dfi and or their portfolios but we want to see if there are any additional opportunities that dfis can take advantage of that aligns with the country priority needs the next slide and so one of the key findings here is that we we are, we are, we were able to map out these um, national priority sectors uh, from these voluminous documents that we had to um, um, assess. And basically, for Ethiopia, there are three main sectors that are of, of priority to 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 their government uh, from their, their development plans: is the agriculture sector, construction sector, and manufacturing sector. Which for me um, is is, is very, very critical because the government of Ethiopia has emphasized that that uh, sector to drive their, their growth and development over the medium term. And for Ghana and, and Kenya, we find that the five uh, sectors are of, of uh, paramount uh, importance uh, to, to them. Um, the sectors are, are construction, energy for Ghana, transportation, healthcare, ICT, and then um, yeah, basically that. And for Kenya, we have energy, education, transport, um, manufacturing, and then the ICT sectors. So I'll hand over to my colleague Alberto, who will take us through the rest of the of the key findings that we found. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you, George, for the introductions. Uh, so I'll keep going from, on to the next slide. 
one of the key findings uh, of the priority sectors um, alignment that we found is that all the countries make explicit plans that are closely aligned. Sorry, most of the countries align their plans to the SDGs, but only Ethiopia makes explicit reference to them. So whilst there is alignment, there isn't an actual uh, referencing to saying we're going to meet these SDG targets in the plans, except for Ethiopia. Now we looked at the, as George explained, we looked at the funding flows uh, across a number of different um, type, typologies of finance, and we found that um, Alignment exists across all three countries, but is overall highest for Ethiopia across the um, four different funding flows. On the other hand, commercial bank credit is greatly aligned in Ethiopia and least of all in Ghana, which means that there's a space in Ghana um, for DFIs to fill that uh, that vacuum, uh, uh, but but there's less space in Ethiopia as commercial finance or already is um, uh, flowing in greater volumes towards priority sectors. Aid is most aligned in Kenya. I think this may need to do with the fact that uh, Kenya has quite a long history in receiving aid as an aid recipient, and there's a long history of um, donors working there. So the alignment uh, with, with country plans um, has over time um, aligned with ODA all the other way around. Um, and finally, DFI finance, which is what we're here for, is mostly aligned in Kenya if we include funds. So um, but if we exclude funds, so for example, just direct investments, either through loans or through equities, then it's actually higher in Ethiopia. Um, so in either case, uh, for, for Ethiopia, it's 60% of uh, funds exclude uh, of uh, of investments that excludes funds are in priority sectors. In Ghana, 58%, so just marginally less um, for investments uh, that exclude funds, uh, excluding funds uh, are in priority sectors. All right, next, thank you. Um, so as I explained, uh, highest in Ghana followed by, uh, 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 sorry, ooh, I made a mistake there, followed by Ethiopia, it should be written there. Uh, in Ethiopia, DFIs are financing the agricultural sector and they provide less finance to the other two countries' strategic sectors, manufacturing and construction. Uh, in Ghana, there's adequate funding in energy and transport sector, while underfunding in construction, healthcare and ICT. And finally, in Kenya, uh, there's funding in energy and the manufacturing stretch, uh, sector. They, they, they seem to receive adequate funding, but education, transport and ICTs are underfunded. Um, keeping in mind that ICT is relatively new sector, so there's probably room to grow there for, for, for funding. Um, and and education is kind of hard for DFIs to um, find opportunities uh, to fund. Uh, the similarly for healthcare, which tends to be more of an older uh, sector. So we have to keep these caveats in mind. Um, however, it's um, it's interesting to note that in Ethiopia, which is trying to set up its manufacturing sector uh, through some SEZ, etc., there's less involvement from the DFIs. But that's maybe because there's commercial financing available uh, as the government backs plans and makes it uh, less risk um, a less less risky proposition for commercial finance to move into manufacturing um uh, right so next slide please um so we're going to dis for the next few slides we're going to discuss the DFI's perspectives and these come from our discussions from the DFI's and how they interact with governments and government strategies uh, so most of the of the DFI's state that there's no specific country uh, strategy in terms of how they want to invest the IFC is an exception they have their private sector development strategies that they um that they elaborate together with the World Bank as part of the World Bank Group. Uh, but um, most DFIs tend to respond to shareholder needs in terms of where of priority sectors and uh, and priority instruments. So if there's more demand to create jobs, they might be more demand to they, they might shape their investments in the future to, to provide more jobs. If there's more interest by shareholders to create jobs in manufacturing, that's how um, that's generally how they're going to shape their investments. Um, so they in, in general, development plans aren't considered at all, and um, 
involving governments is considered to be quite risky, uh, but it is important for them to check if they do have credible plans. Uh, otherwise, certain large scale investments, particularly for energy, wouldn't um, uh, seem to be too risky if the plans are not credible. If the government is places placing emphasis on some uh, large scale energy investments, but it doesn't seem credible that the DFIs are likely not going to go and move into that direction. Um, as one would expect. Next slide, please. Um, interaction with the government can depend on the sector. Uh, for example, investments in forestry um, tend to involve actors that are uh, local actors and they that are that, uh, that work in the sector. So the, the, there's some kind of interaction there. And renewable energy investments also involve interactions with regulators and governments, particularly on purchasing power, um, power purchasing agreements. Um, and that's where um, you will be, uh, the, the DFIs will be interacting with government agencies, particularly if, but not necessarily on government strategy and, and forward development planning. Um, in also, DFI interaction at the local level is is in a sense ad hoc. It depends on the availability of people within the DFI that may have local contacts, um, either in government or with the private sector, but but also on whether local other local um, sorry other institutions from their government uh, from from the ho home co country are well connected. For example, embassies uh, um, that may have um, links to either government or private sector so they can make use of them where these are not available then it's much harder to interact with the government and uh, engage in the planning process even if they had wanted to so that's uh, so, so there isn't a structured approach to say uh, particularly because dfis don't have most dfis don't have except for the ifc uh, don't have their own country offices and so it's a lot harder to create an ongoing engagement process uh, that that carries across governments um, and that carries that 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 is beyond um, changes in personnel either in the government or in the uh, in the DFI itself so that makes it a lot harder to engage over the long term or cre and create relationships um, uh, next slide please they DFIs do work with regulatory agencies, as we've discussed earlier, and um, they um, they tend to mainly. And the, the key here is that DFIs tend to invest mainly in viable companies, and so they aren't particularly, let's let's say, interested in government uh, priorities or government interests. It, it's whether a company is commercially viable and whether it will have development impacts that dictate whether a DFI is going to invest in it or not. And so government interaction, engagement is, is an option, uh, and but, but it's not necessary or required for their investments. Um, next slide, please. So finally, to conclude, we just we discuss a couple of steps that to ensure alignment and enhance uh, impact of DFI investments. Uh, we th we think it would be important for DFIs to have a, a broad understanding, at least, of what the strategic sectors are for the government. Uh, to to understand. The aim is to, to understand where the government are likely to facilitate foreign investment opportunities. Uh, if they are going to facilitate FDI in some sectors, then it's likely that DFI investments in these sectors will also be facilitated. If they are um, likely, if these sectors, if DFIs want to invest in these sectors that, and they know that the gov it's a government priority, if there are any roadblocks to investment in these, it's a lot easier to engage government and help them remove these roadblocks um, uh, compared to sectors that are not strategic because the government will have an interest in doing so. So it's good to know if you are aligned and whether there will be um, a positive uptake from the government to help you resolve particular constraints uh, as well. Uh, and um, then you, we suggest that you compare these strategic sectors with DFI investment activities to see how closely portfolios currently align, and then carry out discussions with um, key stakeholders and that uh, within government, with 
bilateral donor agencies from the same country or multilateral donor agencies to see if there is a space for DFIs to support investment in these key sectors. And then uh, if there is a space to do so, invest within the target priority sector. Uh, of course, it's important to consider that you don't want to be crowding out commercial finance or other or FDI opportunities, um, but in some cases it, it might require DFI investment to kick off um, foreign direct investment within a sector to show the viability, uh, to, to catalyze investment, to have a demonstration effect uh, in particular strategic sectors. And a DFI can really play an important role in doing that uh, and therefore create development opportunities if these have been assessed properly. Um, so that's the end of our presentation. I hope that makes sense. And thank you again. Great. Um, thank you, George and Alberto, for that uh, excellent uh, presentation of the report. And one of the things I really like about this study is that you've combined this doing the analysis of the alignment and, and uh, suggestions on on how you could uh, use this type of methodology if, uh, among DFIs to identify strategic sectors with actual interviews with the DFIs and asking them, you know, what do you think about this basic hypothesis that we have? And that part of the analysis shows that this topic is nonetheless a bit controversial. So it'll be interesting to hear a bit uh, from, from our panelists what they think about, about this. And I, I thought we would start with the, the DFI perspective on this. Um, and so I think we'll start with with um, uh, with, with Stefan from the from the IFC. So the, the question to start is: uh, To what extent do you take country strategies and collaborations with governments into account when developing developing investment strategies and making decisions? And if you don't really do that, why not? And if yes, do you have any examples that you can share uh, about whether this was impactful or not? And you know, kind of lessons learned from that type of engagement. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I didn't have a chance to test before. Good. Perfect. So uh, once more, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my pleasure to be on the panel and uh, also to listening to the presentation uh, just now on the findings of the report, which uh, you know we supported and engaged in, in the interviews, and I'm glad uh, uh, you finalized this and sharing this today. So I'm, uh, my name is Stefan Dreyer. I'm uh, the principal economist at the IFC, the International Finance Corporation for the Africa region. Uh, IFC is, I guess you know, is uh, the largest private sector focused development uh, finance here. Uh, we have uh, over 4,000 staff. We're Washington based, or we have over 4,000 staff across the world. Uh, had commitments last year of uh, 31.5 billion. Uh, in FY21 uh, and work in more than 100 countries. And Africa, of course, is one of our uh, key areas of engagement. Uh, we're also part of the World Bank Group, as what's said. So we, we are one of the four institutions of the larger World Bank Group. And in that sense, uh, I speak a bit of a, uh, from, a, from a position of privilege this morning uh, to uh, about our country engagement process, because of course we largely benefit from the larger sister organization, the World Bank and the processes that they have set up. So maybe uh, just for background, let me uh, give a few uh, pointers on, on how the bank and IFC engages uh, with countries on, on a strategy level. So the core, uh, the, the, the process is uh, called in World Bank terms as country engagement. And the key of this country engagement is a country partnership strategy or country partnership framework, CPF. And we have this for every single member country. We go through this exercise every four to six years. It's a it's a, a country owned process. Uh, so we start uh, engaging the teams and start engaging with government counterparts, uh, but then also with the civil society, private sector, uh, as a starting point, looking at the development objectives that countries have, and from there develop uh, a framework, and then of course a, a framework for also World Bank Group engagement. That's the larger World Bank Group, so that is not just private sector, but it is uh, all uh, covers all areas. Uh, prior to that, the World Bank does a strategic country diagnostic, so that's the analytic underpinning. It's a diagnostic process again. 
uh, jointly done with the countries where we analyze uh, particular areas and that feeds then into the dialogue for the country partnership strategy and that also has a private sector uh, focus. For the IFC, we have a separate, we have a joint process, we're part of that large process, but then we have also our own country strategies uh, similar to the bank, but they are primarily uh, private sector focused. So we look at uh, the private sector context. Uh, we look again at, uh, you know, of course, government development objectives and how they intersect with uh, private sector issues. And uh, we develop then our programming or really more than from a business uh, point of view, IFC develops then a business plan uh, that guides our engagement. And prior to this country strategy, uh, that IFC does, we also have a diagnostic tool. It's called Country Private Sector Diagnostics. Uh, and we do these also for all countries. It's a relatively new tool. We only started about uh, four, five years ago. Uh, but we do all of these. Uh, I mean, we do it for all the countries and we are getting more or less through most of the African countries and the ones uh, that you had under review. Uh, Kenya, Ethiopia, Ghana have uh, existing country private sector diagnostics. They're also uh, online available, so one can look at it. And they, again, take into account government objectives, uh, but not just that. We, you know, and I think that's where, uh, I think in our uh, strategic uh, engagement, certainly on the analytic, uh, when we start on the, with the analytic part, with the diagnostic part, uh, we, we start to uh, sort of triangulate between different objectives. We, of course, we, we look at the government objectives, uh, but we also look at uh, what we hear from the private sector. Uh, we look at what we hear from DFIs, uh, from other uh, shareholders. And, uh, you know, then of course, IFC has its own views because we're active uh, investors and participant in, in most of these markets and have been for years. So we try to triangulate, not to have one view uh, uh, dominate that um, and uh, then come up with our own assessment. And that's really what drives then our strategy in terms of uh, uh, sectors, but also areas of engagement. Uh, and sometimes these things can be, uh, you know, I mean, often they are harmonious, you know, in, in a larger sense, but then uh, not always. Uh, I mean, for example, if we look uh, at, at Ethiopia, you know, you mentioned the government uh, priorities. Uh, we would probably, from an IFC point of view, and you'll see that in the country diagnostic, add some other sectors to it. I mean, we put a strong emphasis, uh, for example, in the case of Ethiopia, on enabling factors such as uh, energy, uh, transport, ICT, and these are areas where we see uh, not just potential for private sector, but also potential for transformation. And I think that's, uh, for from an IFC point of view, uh, a change in strategy. It's in, it's in our internal terms. Uh, uh, it's called IFC 3.0. It's basically we we sort of try to move on, and we I think we have successfully moved on from a, a traditionally more. Uh, uh, reactive process, you know, the normal process where you identify business opportunities and and uh, you follow them if they make commercial sense and sort of fit into the larger picture uh, to uh, a process where we try to actively uh, identify and create uh, market opportunities or markets. And, you know, let's say in the case of Ethiopia, I think there is with these enabling factors uh, or enabling sectors, there's, there's a lot of opportunity uh, for private sector engagement in these sectors, but also what these sectors uh, can accomplish. I mean, they're the driver of, uh, of a lot of uh, other uh, sectors and uh, and uh, have great potential uh, from a, from a development perspective going forward. So so that is sort of the uh, uh, approach that we take uh, when it comes to uh, engagement with countries. Uh, let me perhaps stop here to uh, see maybe then get more engaged on the question to see if that resonates and uh, happy to address any questions. Thank you. Great, Great. thanks. thanks for, thank you for that input. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just a really quick question. Maybe you can just keep it short um, for understanding so we can get to the other other panelists here. But to what extent do other DFIs, are they able to make use of the analysis that uh, and strategies that IFC is uh, is uh, developing? 
so the uh, on the world start with the World Bank side. So all of the World Bank documents are available. So country partnership strategies uh, are published. Uh, the the diagnostics are published. On the IFC side, our analytical. Uh, 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 the country private sector diagnostics are available. They are uh, online uh, and uh, for everyone to see. The country strategies, IFC's country strategies are internal documents, so they're not being shared because uh, a lot of them have then, uh, you know, I mean, gets more into the commercial side of things and into the business plan. So uh, so the, uh, the, the specific strategies are not uh, uh, shared. Great. Um, so I'd like to to move on to to Eric and get your perspective on these things. You're you're working in in, in a development bank and have previous experience with that, and also previous experience. Uh, I mean, you have a long academic experience as well uh, in this in this space. So so perhaps you have a so, some uh, some um, alternative perspectives as well on this. So go ahead, Eric. Let's. Hear okay. What you th th thank you, and thank you for. Uh, inviting me and, and to uh, give some some views on this. So, so um, indeed, I so I'm working now for uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is a, a very new institution. Uh, we are only uh, six years old, and and uh, you know altogether uh, you know, less than 400 people. So it's a, it's a, so it's but it's interesting because we you know we are very much trying to learn from the experience of, of others, and of course I have a. I spent nine years as the chief economist of, of the EBRD, and, and a lot has ha happened during that period uh, in terms of how we uh, approached uh, this issue. So I, I, but I'll come back to that a bit later. I think you know what's just one uh, point to to emphasize, and, and it becomes sort of obvious when you listen to you know the the very broad program that uh, IFC has and all the uh, instruments, and of course the benefits of being part of the. The World Bank Group um, as well. It, 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 it's a point that you know these DFIs are very. It's a very broad um, spectrum of of, of 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 institutions, and and uh, you know one uh, one has to be a little bit careful when when one uh, uh, put them all uh, all together, and 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 there's also some uh, design uh, elements that one should be conscious of. So I mean some of these DFIs are Basically owned by one country, and and some of them are could be bilateral, which you know that they are, um, you know they are. So there is a, a, a giving country and 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 or a giving and investing country and a recipient country, and but the you know IFC and AIB um, are multilateral institutions, and and uh, where the um, countries that where we invest are. Owners and often very important owners uh, of, of of the institution, and and that um, creates uh, this. And, and, and you know, uh, Stefan was emphasizing the the country ownership of this, and I think that is uh, extremely important to when to understand, you know, how these institutions work. Uh, you know, the multilateral DFIs. So that uh, element is is uh, I think it's a critical design element which has to do with also. Um, you know uh, some of the th things that DFIs can offer in terms of um, sort of investor protection or management of, of risk are very much tied to that uh, ownership. So I think the presumption is, which I think, is, and from my experience, is a very real one, is is that um, you know a, a government which would always be tempted, uh, you know, particularly in some of the countries um, that. Um, you know, in the uh, developing world, to to try to expropriate uh, investors and and uh, you know not maybe necessarily um, you know taking specific assets, but changing the rules of the game and, and and those kind of things, and and that is much more difficult, I think, when you have uh, uh, the DFI as an investor and and the DFI you know where you as a government are. Um, uh, is is uh, an important uh, shareholder, or uh, at least a shareholder, and 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 that um, I think is something we should have in mind when we we talk about uh, these issues about to what extent do DFIs uh, work with with, with governments or, or not. So so um, and 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 that's why the, you know, the institutions that you cover are are different in in uh, among themselves in this regard. I, I so. Uh, 
that's one thing that you you um, mentioned, which I think is particularly true for the smaller institution, and it's I would say still true to some extent for AIB that um, you know we are trying to be op opportunistic. You know, we uh, you know obviously the ambition is for AIB to become you know a much larger and much more resourceful um, institution, and, and you know with more um, capacity to to do all the things that that you you call for in in the um, in the report, which I, I think all of that makes makes sense. And I think Stefan gave some good examples on how how um, uh, IFC has tried to deal with this and, and the kind of document the instruments that they have to to um, you know get a more informed conversation with with governments and so on. So um, I, I, I just want has to be. Uh, understand some of these small institutions that it's you know that it's in the beginning and particularly when you're setting up you have to be opportunistic you won't have the resources to engage on on these uh, you know quite uh, resource um, uh, consumption or resource intensive exercises of dialogue with, with governments and setting up uh, country programs and, and and so on and and probably there is also a you know, a little bit of, of reluctance, I can say that from AIB side to to get go get too caught up in in these um, uh, country program uh, exercises. And I think I think IFC, which uh, you know I've followed a little bit uh, that discussion within the IFC when they kind of geared up in recent years. Uh, you know that it wasn't without uh, resistance, and and you know there 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 is some uh, you know some reason for that resistance because you you can be too maybe tied up and and too um, and 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 you want, particularly when you want to work with the private sector part of you know these kind of um, country um, programs can become uh, quite cumbersome and and, and and complicated. But having said that, uh, I think it is very important uh, certainly that you know one tries to align with the country um, uh, development plans and and uh, with SDGs. So, uh, so maybe just a, a, a comment on, on um, uh, you know, what you, you, you go through and, and very nicely, and uh, even though it's not so clear exactly how you do it, but you, you go through all these uh, sectors uh, or all these uh, the three countries and look at uh, the uh, SDGs and, and you, you sort of tick the boxes. It's not so obvious how you do that. And, and, and you know, so I've just taken, um, so Ethiopia supposedly has, does not care about uh, reducing inequality. It doesn't uh, really want to ensure sustainable consumption. I agree, you can understand it's landlocked, so it doesn't care so much about conserving and and, and sustainability of oceans. But uh, you know, maybe it has uh, some other marine um, issues that it, it 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 cares about. And of course, the, the landlocked nature of Ethiopia is is uh, a very complex it's, it's a fact that complicates its relationship to other countries in, in the region and, and, and uh, so you would think also that that some of the this access to water and so on this is, is important for Ethiopia. It also doesn't care about peaceful and and um, and inclusive societies, justice for all and institutional uh, development. I'm, I'm saying you know this uh, exactly how you got to that conclusion is it's not so clear from from the report. Um, uh, I was going to make a point about um, bankability. I mean, you, you set up the criteria here about, um, you know, additionality, development impact and catalytic effects. And, and I think those are very important. And additionality is something particularly important when you work in private sector development. You don't, you don't want to crowd out um, private sector. You want to make sure that you are additional and, and, and you know, also and, and so that's a good point. But the bankability issue is, is very uh, important because the bankability is about what a project can be made to work uh, and in the con in context of, of individual countries. And, and uh, that's also where these sort of opportunistic uh, can come in that, you know, a lot of projects that governments may want to favor may not be bankable uh, from a, a DFI uh, perspective. Let, let me end with, with um, you know, two very quick comments. The, the, one is uh, that, uh, so as I said, at, at EBID, I, I follow this quite closely. Uh, so the institutional development, if you, if you say, um, and it was one thing that was very important part of, of what I tried to push when I was there, was to, you know, when you talk about private sector development, 
it's important to have two legs. You want to have one leg that sort of tries to yeah, identify these deals, help to develop the pipeline of bankable, you know, and and and, and projects, and and making sure that there's additionality and all those things. That's you know very clear. I think what was less clear and and um, where um, a lot happened in in the nine years that I was um, at EBRD was that the the, the policy dimension that P, you know, private sector development is very policy dependent, and you know it's about it's about developing the private sector, but a lot about developing the private sector is actually about developing the state sector to 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 you know to really make the state uh, a a you know, supportive and 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 facilitating actor and in in allowing private sector development. So um, that was a I think the EBRD that I know the best of these uh, of. of of maybe of all institutions that has that component, because I would say that AIB, we don't really yet have it. We, we very much want to go there, I think, in, in the end, but at the moment we don't have really the resources. We, I mean, I'm trying to do it in, in, in some specific cases, but but in, in general we don't have it. But, but that development has, I think, made, for example, in the African context, the, the fact that EBRD is now looking at Africa, uh, that they have those two legs is very important argument for them when they try to to go into to this country. Let me end just with a very quick point on on uh, on uh, the role of um, DFIs and coordination and working with governments. And it's something that I'm I'm been deeply involved in, in in various contexts. It's it's the notion of, of you know how do you do this and then this notion of, of country platforms. It sounds very um, Kind of uh, bureaucratic and 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 uh, maybe um, you know in a bit uh, theoretical, but it actually is is very um, I think a very important concept that is, is taking form and, and you know it's something that uh, I, I was part of, of the secretariat for the uh, so-called eminent persons group uh, uh, where we developed this notion of country platforms and and that was um, I think. Uh, uh, you know, we had a lot of interesting discussions when we developed it as, at the time, but it has now taken on, uh, I think, legs of its own. So the EU, for example, now using this very, I think, uh, in an interesting way, creatively in, in its relationship to Turkey, it's going to be critical to how, how it works now in Ukraine. It has established a country platform. Uh, in, and and uh, it, it, there are a lot of pilots around countries trying to, to, to do this, and I think there's a lot to learn from that because it's, it's the basis is to have country ownership, uh, uh, bring everyone on, on board uh, in both the, the, the large uh, uh, international financial institutions, but also the DFIs, and eventually the private sector and philanthropics uh, uh, as well onto that platform, agree on certain standards, uh, transparency, debt sustainability, procurement, uh, and uh, ultimately SDGs. And I think all that, if we can get country platforms to work uh, in a more systematic fashion, I think a lot of the issues that the report is addressing could 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 be dealt with in a very effective way. Sorry, I was a bit lengthier than I had uh, anticipated, but but uh, thank you for listening. Thanks. Thanks so much, Eric, and I really appreciate a, a lot of interesting points about uh, bankability so that these types of this type of uh, analysis doesn't magically create bankable projects. Um, uh, and also this this combination of looking at the policy space more broadly and how you interact and support government to support private sector investment. And then, of course, this issue about the differences in, in, in different DFIs is very important, and I think we go over to Bruno uh, now, who has the difficult task of speaking uh, kind of uh, on behalf of all these different uh, DFIs and uh, trying to say something uh, kind of um, uh, in response to this question, this issue from all those different perspectives. So, so Bruno, over to you. So many thanks. Um, and uh, first of all, thank uh, SEI and ODI for the report and for encouraging the debate, since it's helped to better understand how DFI works and how DF I contribute to the SDGs and to the Paris Agreement on Climate. I think uh, the starting point is important to understand that DFIs are not development banks. Development banks have the mandate, the capacity, the tools, the instruments, as well as the leverage to be engaged in policy dialogue. I will come back to this issue in a minute. 
DFIs, as uh, Eric has already pointed out, are opportunistic and they rely on local, regional and international investors that are willing to invest in a country or in a particular sector with our support. And for investment decisions, development plans are not decisive. The key is a level of in enabling environment. So therefore, it is essential that governments create the right policy environment when translating development priorities into concrete policies. For example, it's not sufficient simply to say the priorities on sustainable energy for all. If the regulatory framework is not in place that allows for independent power producers. For example, we, uh, one of our members, DEG in Kenya, was the first one to, in, to, in, to invest in, um, in renewable energies and they found out that there were no regulated framework in place, especially there was no PPA, power purchase agreements. And so they introduced as part of as a due diligence process, uh, this PPA, which uh, for many, many years was being used in Kenya and replicated by other, by other countries. So coming back to the key questions, do receiving country priorities matter? Clearly, yes. But if these priorities are reflected in appropriate policies that allow investors to invest. But having said that, then uh, we at the EDFI community are quite aware that we have to be engaged much more in helping governments in creating the environment for private sector engagement. Because if we accept what I have said, then we could not do a proper job because simply uh, as uh, because there's a lack of policy in place and because there's a lack of policy in place, there's a lack of, uh, of, of investors. And this is especially true and more complicated when we are talking about fragile states and post-conflict contracts in the context of Africa. And that is what we call upstream activities. For example, we at EDFI, we have partnered with the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative and have published jointly with the Global Infrastructure Facility a paper for policymakers on attracting private climate finance. And within the DFI roundtable that is jointly chaired by IFC and EDFI, we have created working groups at the country level, for example, in Ethiopia and Nepal, where DFIs identifies investment bottlenecks and then being engaged in the policy dialogue. And by the way, that what uh, Stephen mentioned is uh, all these papers that are produced by the World Bank and by the IFC, they're either being, con uh, uh, being prepared in consultation with, with the EDFI members or uh, uh, through, uh, through our executive directors and uh, the shareholder structures. So, and we are using these papers uh, quite frequently. The upstream activities that I have uh, 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 spoken on are designed to help MDBs and development banks to better integrate private sector related policy issues in their policy dialogue with governments and their policy related TA and loan activities. So instead of building our own capacity for small institutions and know-how for rather small country por portfolios, we strongly believe that coordinating more and better with the multilateral development banks and uh, the development banks is the best and the most efficient way, not only for us, but also by doing so by avoiding additional transaction costs for governments dealing then with a separate uh, 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 segment uh, of, uh, of financiers. A good example in this respect is the joint work of uh, multilateral development banks, uh, development banks and uh, DFIs in context of the G7 on sustainable infrastructure finance with a focus on what needs to be done to mobilize the private sector where MDBs and uh, development banks play a crucial role in supporting governments to create an enabling environment. We recognize that we have a crucial transformative role and we would like to do much more. One example is uh, introduction of renewable energy in, in, uh, in South Africa. Uh, the government uh, decided uh, to, to, to abolish the monopoly of uh, ESCOM, has created an uh, in the regulated environment, but there was no trust by the private sector. And this is why in the, the first two and then in the uh, first three rounds of uh, of, uh, of procurement and tendering, uh, mostly the financing was provided by, by development uh, finance institutes. And by doing so, we have provided also confidence and trust in the whole system. And the fourth round, we were not needed anymore. That's really our transformational uh, role. And we would like to do much more, especially with regard to climate and energy, where we see 
helping governments to transform to uh, 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 to be in line with the Paris Agreement, and in particular in fragile and post-conflict countries. And to this end, our members have increased their advisory activities, helping clients to comply with accepted international ESG standards, transforming to a more climate resilient business model and to promote skills development. We could do more and therefore call on our owners to increase their risk appetite and to increase the access to guarantees and TA, which are essential in order to do what you are requesting for. Thanks. Great, Bruno. And I, <laughs> it's great to hear from, from all three of you that um, you've ended or, or, or kind of the solutions, uh, the types of solutions that uh, that uh, could be employed or are being employed are, have been outlined by you. Uh, and so I think we've got a lot of uh, yeah, great input on, on, on that side of things. Um, and very informative. Uh, I think we want to go now to to look from the country perspectives and see the other side of the equation here. Um, so uh, I think we'll start off with uh, Yofi Grant, uh, the CEO of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center. Uh, and I want to un understand from your perspective, how do you work with uh, DFIs uh, to and, and how does how do you work in terms of engaging with DFIs to promote also national priorities and national development priorities and how does the, how has it been working and if you have any examples it's great as well um thank you very much and my apologies for joining late i'm actually out of location so i got the timing wrong but um, i'm still grateful to be here so my apologies um, that i haven't listened to most of it indeed um for us in ghana um we were probably the first country to mainstream sdgs in our budgetary process of the ministry of finance and so what we tried to do was to create alignment between our objectives, our development objectives, and, um, uh, and, and our plans um, to ensure that they are well aligned with achievement of the SDGs. But um, I'll just quickly uh, probably rifle through some of the issues as well as how we engage on that, on that perspective. So we define in our budget what our priorities are, and then we actually um, do engage with the DFIs to see where our assistance package is. I must also say that um, for us, um, it's a question of priorities, it's a question of alignment um, of objectives, and then the question of achievement of the SDGs as a national priority. So on that, and that's how we engage with the DFIs. But I must also say that um, sometimes there are issues of uh, confusion on defining um, the SDGs in, in, in the country perspective. Because let's say, for, for example, in education, for us, um, the, the main objective is access to education. But to um, um, a DFI that is coming from a developed country, um, they will tr probably be talking more of the quality end of education than just the access to education. And when you have these definitional or uh, conceptual uh, differences, then sometimes it becomes very difficult to even understand the policy objectives of the country. Um, and we see quite a lot of that in Africa. And also there, there is a view, a long-term held view, that very often the, D, the DFIs are pretty patronizing and they come to tell you what they are going to do for you when you have your plan of what you want to do and what you want to achieve. And it's always a, an issue of negotiating and bargaining for that and the terms which may not necessarily uh, be favorable to the host nation. But we do have uh, significant support from the DFIs, even from the investment promotion side, where we are, um, and I, I'd, I'd like to cite examples where we are benefiting from uh, technical assistance from GIZ um, in, in building an aftercare service to ensure that we give um, necessary support to um, foreign direct investment that comes in. Um, although I recognize that DFIs normally do not engage on the on the FDI side because um, they mo mainly engage with governments and do not do pr direct private sector support. Um, in, a, in some cases, we have seen that, for example, the IFC. Um, but I, I, I hope this would not be a jab. Uh, but in the minds of many private sector people, they would rather not deal with the IFC because it takes quite a while to get, you know, um, a project uh, passed through the IFC and by which time uh, the project is approved, things would have moved on and changed. So there are uh, some, it's not almost always a homogeneous relationship with the DFIs, 
Um, and, I, and I say that uh, perhaps um, the, real, the real elephant in the room is the DFIs aligning more to the country perspective uh, because there, there are interests um, that need to be um, aligned. It's not just the fact that there is support available, but the interest and the outcomes must be aligned. Why is the DFI going to support this? It's development finance. So if I come to you and say that I want DFI support to build an ICT infrastructure, which to me would rather create a bigger economy for my achievement of SDGs, um, I expect that the DFI would understand my objective and my perspective. But then they'll come and say, well, no, we don't have ICT in our list of stuff. We would rather do health or education. Um, and, and so very often we find quite a number of DFIs getting their knickers in a twist because they are um, either supporting uh, programs that already have support or want to support programs that already have support. While there are other areas which the country may consider very important that have been left to the states to take care of. But um, all in all, for me, it's a question of a relationship. And that is why um, SDG 17 for us in Ghana is the most important one, partnerships and linkages. So where DFIs may not necessarily lend the support, they can create the linkages that can create, uh, uh, you know, more channels for other DFIs to also engage. Um, and, and so um, I, I think because of time, I wouldn't want to go into some of the details, but those are some of the things that immediately pop out. <laughs> Um, and secondly, most DFIs would want to deal with the state, with the governments. But I dare say that if you come to um, a lot, uh, most of Africa today is very private sector focused um, and takes a lot of the decision making out of the politics into real demands once you go to the private sector. So my appeal is that there, there needs to be a lot more focus on direct engagement with private sector, because that is where I think that you will get best alignment of real interest as well as results, um, uh, get a lot of results. Because when it's with the state, um, then you have to succumb to what the state tells you or gives you as priorities. Thanks, thanks, Sophie. We, we do need to, to, to move move on because we're running out of time here and I want to make sure and that has, has enough time. But I mean, great, interesting points on the need for increased dialogue, but also addition, you're adding additional dimensions of, of, of maybe it's more about dialogue with the private sector than necessarily government. So that's that's something really interesting to hear as well. Um, but let's let's move on to uh, Anzetza so that she, she can have the final minutes here. Um, Thank you. I'll just go ahead and start. And I just want to build on one what um, Yopi has pointed out because it's, it's a real problem around particularly, you know, the DFI role in economic transformation and a sense of lethargy that I see in playing that transformation role, particularly when it comes to um, making sectors feasible. So one of the things I think to consider in this conversation is what is the DFI's role specifically in project origination through to reporting disclosure and in the project? Because sometimes what I see is a, is a congregation of DFIs at the point in the investment cycle when all of the hard work has been done, and then we get stories about how there are no bankable projects, no, pre, no project bank mm -hmm. is an issue. But frankly, if we're not dealing with the project origination, project preparation, and the actual funding requirement processes, then of course those bottlenecks are going to be there. And so what we see, particularly on our side, is that you have a sense of a sector that has that maybe can be quite dynamic from a private sector perspective, but we will not see the attendant uh, appetite for the technical and financial investment for origination through at least to investment preparedness. And as a result, when those few investment prepared uh, firms are ready, there's a there's an almost a competition, you know, not only among DFIs, but among other, other financiers to try and get that off the ground. So what we're seeing is, is, is almost a, a, a lopsided, uh, you know, creation of, of investment uh, uh, possibilities and investment pipelines in, in, in many of our economies, which is, a, which is a problem. I think just to the point around DFIs and, and how I've seen them uh, interact with government and the private sector, and just to say I, I work for a think tank and so I work with DFIs, I work with government, I work with private sector. I think definitely the technocratic consistency of government is, is key, yeah? And, and, and not only just the policy consistency, but the technocratic consistency to the application of whatever work stream has been agreed to. And I think the, the form of governance in the country matters, yeah, but also 
uh, the stability at, at, the, the, at the highest level of government actually informs the ability of those lead technocrats to follow through on whatever priority decisions that had been made. So I think it is for the DFIs to think through what is the process of allyship building in your priority sectors with the technocratic leads in those governments, because that will have a material effect on then the end line impact you have at whatever stage, um, because, you know, the leads of the technocrats may change, but sometimes the layers between the leads, those can be quite stable. So I think what I've not seen as much in, in many DFIs is a very deliberate uh, relationship building process uh, in the arms of government that matter, particularly around policy objectives and policy consistency, because that then tends to afford, affect the private sector environment that I think um, the other panelists have agreed to. And I think just to, you know, to make a final point around the brand and the relationship dynamics that DFIs have with governments. I think this point has been made. Every DFI will have a different brand in how the government and the private sector view it. And I think it would be interesting, I think, for DFIs to, to do that um, test in the market, to get a sense of how is their brand perceived by government, by private sector, because then that gives you a sense of the level of appetite to engage with you. Yeah. So I think for government to have the brand and that sort of stuff, but also their own fiscal position and the other options that they have in terms of financing, but then on private sector as well, you, you know, you, you, you'll be interfacing with that. And I think I'll just close with just uh, the, the, the encouragement to the country platforms, because the lack of coordination has a real impact on bandwidth, on whether it's the private sector or the government. You know, you're dealing with multiple DFIs. Everybody has their projects, their methodologies, their data, their results it gets a bit much. So I think really encouraging more coordination, um, I think would foster a deeper pipeline um, and, 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 and more stable investment cycles. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. So um, I think we're at time now. So uh, Mons, maybe you want to uh, close us out with a, with a couple of words. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, we, we did uh, uh, schedule this as a tight uh, seminar for just one hour. So uh, it, uh, it's clear from the conversation that we could have gone on much longer, um, given the uh, important of, importance of the topic and the really crucial aspect of uh, being a catalyst for uh, DFIs for commercially you know, viable companies and projects. And, and uh, this is going to be a close, uh, important topic for us uh, over the coming years, without a doubt. Also within the Stockholm Environment Institute, where we're not uh, centrally focused on financial mechanisms, etc., but but really uh, want to be uh, at the forefront of, of bringing the sustainability aspects in us, you know, the science of sustainability into the financial institutions and the practices uh, of finance. So with that, uh, um, thank you all for joining and uh, we do look forward to the continuation and to be able to uh, download this work. Please visit the website there, Stockholm Sustainable Finance Center dot com uh, and SCI.org, ODI.org. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.